Good morning to everybody, um, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for being here today to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Norman E. Borlaug receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, this, this session today will share uh, fond memories of the Green Revolution and discuss some of the continuing work that has happened over the last 50 years that has been inspired by the Borlaug legacy. Uh, as Meredith already uh, indicated, I'm professor and department head of plant pathology and co-director of the Stakeman Borlaug Center. Uh, we're part of the College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Resource Sciences at the University of Minnesota. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. And we have a really just stellar lineup of speakers today. Um, we will hear from Ronnie Kaufman, uh, Jeannie Borlaug, um, thanks. Um, Ronnie Kaufman, Jeannie Borlaug, Arif Hussein, uh, Holly Ann Tufan, Sheng and Fen, Barbara Stinson, and members of the uh, Minnesota Youth Institute, including Aiden uh, Stadili, Priscilla Trin, and Glenn Morris. And we'll hear from Brian Bohr. Now I'll offer more extensive uh, biographical information for each of these speakers as we move through the program today. And as um, time allows, we will address questions. So please do use the chat function throughout uh, the uh, program today. And we'll get to those questions at the very end of the program. Additionally, some of our uh, speakers, Jeannie Borlaug, Barbara Stinson, Ronnie Kaufman, and the Minnesota Youth Institute alumni will hang around after the program today for small group discussion. So if you would like to have conversations with any of these individuals, please stay on the Zoom call after the end of the program and Meredith will uh, provide further instructions at that point. Now, before we begin the program today, I need to take a moment to say thank you to many people who made this event possible. A lot of planning and passion went into creating this event today. Um, I want to thank Meredith McQuaid, who is the Associate Vice President and Dean of International Programs for the University of Minnesota System. Lisa Lewis, who is President and CEO of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Uh, France and Francis Homans, who is Department Head of Applied Economics and Agricultural Education, Communication and Marketing, all here at the University of Minnesota. These individuals uh, were passionate about this idea and contributed significantly to the formation of the the speaker lineup that you'll see today. I also need to take a moment to recognize and thank the event planning committee. Uh, these folks worked tirelessly to bring this event to you today. Um, I'd like to thank Brian Stephenson, who is um, professor and Lieberman Okinawa Endowed Chair in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Mary Buschetti, who is the Director of Alumni and, and um, uh, committee of Relationships for the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, and our communications team, especially Tim Lesh, who's Director of Communications, and a special thank you to Meredith Dwyer, who has worked behind the scenes to make this event possible. Uh, she's actually running the technology today, and we owe uh, Meredith a, a particular thank you. I'm also happy to uh, welcome some special guests. Uh, we have with us members of the Borlaug family, and strong supporters of the Borlaug legacy. I especially want to welcome Don and Sandy Henry, who are with us. Um, locally, they are among our, our top um, supporters of the Borlaug legacy at the University of Minnesota, and we're delighted that you're here today. We have more than 400 registrants for today's event, um, and our registrants come from across the US and really around the globe. Uh, this is a truly international audience today, and uh, we're happy to welcome participants from the American Samoa, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, China, Costa Rica, India, Israel, Italy, Kenya, Malaysia, the Netherlands, South Africa, and Uruguay. Wherever you are in the world today, thank you very much for taking time to celebrate um, this momentous occasion. I'm also happy to welcome the recipients of the University of Minnesota Norman E. Borlaug Fellowship for International Agriculture. Uh, we have with us today Anil Adhikari, Eric Nazarino and Zena Koske, and Zena's um, zooming in from Kenya today. Uh, welcome to each of you. We'll, we'll learn a bit more about this fellowship later in today's program. Finally, I want to extend a welcome to the Borlaug scholars from the Minnesota Youth Institute and their teachers and mentors. And we're, we're joined by several of the alumni, um, and we'll hear more about this program later as well. Now to kick off the program today, we have a special introduction from University of Minnesota President Joan Gable. 
Good morning, my name is Joan Gable and I'm the president of the University of Minnesota and I would like to welcome all of you who are joining us from across the world for this special symposium, Nobel and Beyond, building on the legacy of a hunger fighter. During the depths of the Great Depression in fall of 1933, a humble Iowa farm boy by the name of Norman Borlaug came quite literally by chance to Minnesota with the goals of being admitted to the University of Minnesota and being a member of the practice squad for the nationally ranked Minnesota Golden Gopher football team. After a rough academic start, Borlaug went on to earn his BS degree in forestry in 1937 and later his MS and PhD degrees in plant pathology in the early 1940s. The broad education Burlog received at the university served him well on the world stage in the future. Working for the Rockefeller Foundation in sun-drenched fields of Mexico in the mid-1940s, Borlaug established a large, innovative wheat breeding program that ultimately led to the development of high-yielding wheat varieties that were also disease-resistant and widely adapted to many regions of the world. These bin-busting varieties made Mexico self-sufficient for wheat in less than a decade. In the 1960s, mass famine was imminent in South Asia. Many experts believe that nothing could be done to save the millions of people who were sure to starve to death in India and Pakistan. Enter Norman Borlaug. He tirelessly worked to export his high-yielding wheats into India and Pakistan, and then applied the latest agronomic practices to make them super productive. As the wheats became widely distributed and cultivated across the two countries, they more than doubled the yields of current varieties. Borlaug and his Green Revolution wheats are credited with saving hundreds of millions of people from starvation. Agriculture is not a category for the Nobel Prizes, but the Nobel Committee stated that providing the wheat for the bread that ultimately gave the world peace, Borlaug should be bestowed with the Nobel Peace Prize. And so it was in December of 1970 in Oslo, Norway. Today's symposium marks the 50th anniversary of this momentous event. I think it's especially appropriate that exactly half a century after Borlaug received the Peace Prize that the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the World Food Program for its efforts to combat world hunger. As we commemorate one of the University of Minnesota's most distinguished alumni and one of the world's greatest humanitarians, we also hope this symposium will highlight solutions for feeding the nine billion people that will soon live on this planet. I'm very proud of our dedicated university community that's making great strides in fighting hunger across many fronts and our commitment to our ag innovation and impact work through MPAC 2025, the university's first system-wide strategic plan. Building on the legacy of the great hunger fighter Norman Borlaug, our students are bringing great enthusiasm, innovative practices, and resiliency to bear on the world's most pressing problems. I know this experience and their time here will serve them well as they continue to work in sectors locally and globally, in industry and in nonprofit and government organizations, leveraging their University of Minnesota education to make a real fight and impact in the work against hunger. Thank you for your participation today. I wish you great success in the symposium. Uh, that was University of Minnesota President Joan Gable. And next, um, I'm happy to introduce Ronnie Kaufman. Ronnie is uh, International Professor of Plant Breeding and the Andrew H. and James S. Tisch, Distinguished University Professor at Cornell University. Ronnie was also Norman Borlaug's only graduate student and happened to be in the field with Norman on the day um, in which Norman was first learned that he had been selected for the Nobel Peace Prize. Ronnie is vice chair of the Borla Global Rust Initiative, the BGRI, and from 2008 to 2020 oversaw global projects to address the threats of climate change, wheat stripe rust, and wheat stem rust, isolate UG99, to world wheat. Ronnie has extensive international experience. And Ronnie, we're very happy that you're here with us today. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, let me share the screen here and if everybody can see that okay everybody sees it it looks it's great okay thanks so uh well uh thanks for the introduction jim i was uh, Borlaug's uh, graduate student, uh, his only PhD student, he had master's students in Mexico, 
this is my final exam uh, at Cornell. It, uh, it was actually more of a press conference, the uh, newspaper, you know, he just won the Nobel Prize and uh, newspaper people came to Ithaca from all over the region. So we only had about 15 minutes for the exam. The rest of the time we were talking to newspaper people. So that's, you recognize Dr. Borlaug there. And, and uh, uh, the person on my left is Neil Jensen, who was my professor at uh, Cornell. And on the right is David Thurston. Some of you plant pathologists at Minnesota will know him. The, the, the graduate students called him Smoking Doc Thurston. You see in front of him two ashtrays there, one of them already full as we move through the exam. <laughs> so, uh, so I know the main thing you want to hear from me is, you know, the moment when Dr. Borlaug uh, uh, heard that he'd won the prize. And then I want to spend a few minutes just to, uh, the dean asked me to talk a bit about, you know, what I saw for the for the future of research in, in uh, feeding the, the world's population. So the, the, Dr. Borlaug heard uh, about the prize. We were, we were working in the Toluca Valley. Uh, most of you know that uh, the, the uh, cement wheat program uh, operated between two locations, so at Otto Brigon and Toluca. And we were working F2s, uh, the plant breeders will know what that means, uh, selecting plants, uh, there was a crew, maybe eight or 10 of us. And we looked up and we saw a car coming down through the experiment station. And Norm saw that car, he said, uh, that looks like Margaret, uh, his wife, of course. And, but she didn't know her way around the station. She was over, you know, on the other side of a very large irrigation ditch, about a hundred yards from where we were working. So she stopped the car over there and she got out. She, she had a very uh, strong voice. And so she says, Norman, you won the Nobel prize. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Borlaug, uh, he didn't know what to think. He really didn't believe it. He, he went over and uh, to the edge of the ditch and uh, they shouted across the ditch for a few minutes. We couldn't hear it all, but maybe five minutes and uh, Margaret left and uh, Dr. Borlaug came back and we went back to work. And none of us quite thinking that it was really true, especially Norm, I think. But then in about 30 minutes, a reporter from the Associated Press showed up. And uh, that's when we you know, realized it was really true. It was just a single reporter. And he started talking to Dr. Borlaug. And then in about 30 more minutes, a, a whole army of reporters arrived. I mean, there must have been uh, 30 or so, including a big... Uh, NBC film crew. There's a video of it all if you'd like to see it at some point. Uh, it turned out that uh, the first reporter from the Associated Press had encountered a farmer up the road and asked directions uh, to get to Dr. Borlaug, where Dr. Borlaug was working. And the farmer told him and the, the, the reporter said, well, if anybody else asks you, send them down that road over there. So, uh, you know, er almost everybody went the wrong way and this Associated Press reporter had 30 minutes with Dr. Blog and he headed back from Mexico City to to file his story. So that's that's the way it happened. So the two things I wanted to mention, you know, I think the future calls for uh, more of what we did in Dr. Borlaug's last project, which was the Borlaug Glo uh, Global Rust Initiative, uh, uh, of which Jeannie is now the chair. It started off with Dr. Borlaug as the chair. This is him in the field at the launch in, in October of, uh, of, of uh, 2008. I'll just run through this quickly because we don't have a, a lot of time, but this is, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, I think, successful projects ever organized. It spanned the entire wheat, wheat growing world. Here are the objectives. Uh, I know Linda McCandless is on this uh, 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 program and she, she, she did all the work of putting this together and I, I can't do it true justice, but uh, 
these these are the objectives of the project uh and you know the main objective of course was to get uh, rust resistant wheat uh, uh varieties out in front of ug99 which was a new virulent race of wheat stem rust threatening the entire global cr crop and we succeeded in, in doing that with 445 plus varieties uh, out there at this at this point we have a surveillance system that covers the entire wheat growing world the largest uh, surveillance the plant disease surveillance system uh, in in the world we expanded the shuttle program to include rust screening in the great rift valley in enjoro uh, kenya which is close to the origin of uh, ug99 uh, we increased the capacity, especially in Ethiopia and Kenya and other wheat growing countries uh, extensively with modern uh, machinery, greenhouses and uh, so forth. We uh, uh, strengthened the training pipeline, which uh, Dr. Borlaug uh, first established at Semit for wheat workers all over the uh, in, in entire world. And uh, we improve the knowledge sharing with open access of publications, uh, a large number of publications that emanated from this project. You can see a summary here in the blue box. And importantly, we brought women into wheat work. Uh, and these are some of the women that were trained. You'll see Holly Tufan, who you're going to hear from later. Uh, there in 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 the photo, along with uh, many of her uh, colleagues that were trained, uh, data management and other objectives. Uh, are all, I don't have time to cover in detail, but, but the main thing was to produce seed and get this out uh, to the farmers, which we have done in a very uh, uh, successful manner. So. This is a, a, a brief summary of the kind of project that I think we're going to need to have uh, in, in the future as we deal with some of these uh, uh, global challenges that society faces. The other thing I wanted to say is I'm not so concerned about our ability to meet the food needs of people. I'm more concerned about the rural livelihoods of uh, people uh, all over the world as some of the technologies uh, come on board. You know, we're looking at a new era of cellular agriculture, which has the ability to produce animal proteins. Uh, already places like Singapore, the city states like Singapore are investing heavily in these technologies and they're producing milk without cows, beef without cows, chicken without chickens and so forth. This is coming, this kind of technology. It's more expensive than direct production from animals at this point, but that's almost certainly going to change. So it has huge implications for livelihoods in our country and and all over the world so this is something that we need to consider so thank you jim that's my presentation i hope i'm under the timeline perfect rami thank you very much for your your thoughts um certainly recollections of that fateful day and for all the work that you and your colleagues have done um, in the name of food security over the last several decades we really appreciate you being here today and um, now it's my, my privilege to uh, introduce Jeannie Borlaug Lobby. Uh, Jeannie is the daughter of Norman Borlaug, and as Ronnie mentioned, the chair of the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative, or the BGRI. Uh, Jeannie spent 40 years of her career teaching Spanish to high school students, and over the past 25 years created and has directed community service programs for the Hockaday School and St. Mark's School in Dallas, Texas. In her role as chair of the BGRI, uh, Jeannie leads an international consortium of more than a thousand scientists from 22 different institutions. 
and she promotes BGRI activities and uh, um, fosters the passion that she shares with her father for a few food secure future, especially for the small holder farmers in Africa and Asia. In 2010, the BGRI established the Jeannie Borlaug Lobby Women in Triticum Early Career Award or the WIT Award, and in 2011, the WIT Mentor Award. And Jeannie is a strong advocate for professional development opportunities for women and for men, and is very proud to be associated with all of the accomplished WIT awardees. Jeannie, thank you so much for being with us today. It's always nice to see you. Thank you, Jim. And I want to thank the University of Minnesota for hosting this great symposium and also for Cornell University for helping and the World Food Program for fostering the future uh, with the Global Youth Institute, which, of course, my dad would be so excited to see how productive and positive it has become. And of course, to all of you speakers and of the audience that are uh, sharing this wonderful day when my dad received this award 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, well, so your father did receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he's also one of only a, a small number of people in the history of the world to also receive the US Congressional Medal of Honor and the US uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, I understand you've got the medals with you today and are willing to, to share them with us. I do. Would you like to see them now? Please. Um, well, the first medal that we, that he got, well, not the first, but this is the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, he was presented this to the, he was presented with this 50 years ago today in Oslo, Norway. And I was, we were very fortunate that I, my brother, Bill Borlaug and myself and our spouses and my mom were able to attend this ceremony in Oslo. Here's the back of it. And uh, we cherish this award. We have kept it in the family so that like when I wanna go to Minnesota and see the youth in Minnesota, um, I take it with me. Um, I took it to Iowa a couple of years ago. It's been to Cornell, it's been all over. And we decided that it was, that my dad would prefer us to keep it and have youth and the rest of us touch it and see that this is possible for anybody that wants to achieve something like this. Then the second award that he got was the Medal of Freedom, which was given to him in 19, I think 1971, and it was given to him by President Ford. And again, we were all able to uh, observe this um, presentation. And then one that he got in 2000 in, um, seven and and the wonderful part is that he he was alive when he got all these awards so it was he enjoyed well he i don't know if he enjoyed getting all these awards because he was a very private person but he got them and when when um they made this award they wanted a picture of him and they wanted a quote and he said no i don't want a quote just put just don't put anything on it and he they said dr borlaug we have to put a quote on and so the quote on this is the first essential component for social justice is adequate food for all mankind. And that was through the act of Congress. So these are the wonderful medals that um, I am able to take around the world and share with people that are interested in seeing what um, my dad has done. Really incredible. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, and, and also the memories that go along with them. It's, it's really very Thank special. You. Um, you, you, you characterize your, your, your father um, as a private individual. And I, I also think of him very much as a humble person um, who did incredible things. Uh, he was always very quick to recognize teamwork as essential to his efforts um, and, and the Green Revolution. And I'm, I'm thinking of folks like Alvin Stakeman, who was a lifelong mentor, uh, George Harar, who led the Mexican Project, Vern Rutan, who was a uh, economist here at University of Minnesota. And around the world, there were many, many people that were part of your father's team. Um, there's one person in particular I'd like to hear about today, and, and that's your mother. Could you maybe share some recollections of how your mother contributed to your father's work? Uh, my mother was a great contributor to my dad's success. Uh, when they were at the University of Minnesota, she actually gave up her last two years uh, at the university to be a, because she was offered a job as a um, 
she was offered a job and um, daddy didn't have any money. So they decided that it was best for her to work and give up her opportunities for his. And so right there from the very get go, she was willing to uh, give up for what he wanted. And then of course they left Minnesota after many, after several years and went to Delaware. And while they were in Delaware, my dad was offered a job um, with Rockefeller Foundation. And so he went back to Mexico. He went down to Mexico and left my mother and myself. I was a baby then uh, in Delaware. And then we eventually got down to Mexico. And I, I, the minute we got down to Mexico, I'm sure that he shuttled off to Toluca or, or Obregón or somewhere. So my mother was the foundation, the strong link in our family. Uh, and my dad knew that. He knew that my brother, Bill, and myself were take, well taken care of. And so he could go ahead and do all his work and not worry about what was happening on the home front. He would come home and say, I need money, Margaret. And she'd say, well, go to the bank. He said, I don't know where the bank is. So that was how dependent he was on my mom. But I, don't, I think in reality, he didn't think he was really that dependent on her. But um, he, was a, he, um, he was a great father and um, he... And, and my mother, as I said, always supported everything that he did. She didn't, he, he didn't even have a key to the house because he kept losing the keys. So my mom didn't even give him a key to the house. He'd show up at the home and knock on the door because he was trying to get in the house. So that was, um, she was just the greatest. And she was a great mother, a great friend, and a great wife, and a great best friend to my brother and myself. Really beautiful and the world's a better place. Um both because of the efforts of your father and, and because of the support and efforts of your mother. Um, thank you for sharing that. Would, would you tell us a little bit more about your role with BGRI and the, the Women in Triticum Award Program in particular? Well, uh, when Ronnie called me the year, I guess it was the year daddy died and said, I'd like you to be on this board. And I went, well, I, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm not just, but I am a Spanish teacher and a community service director. And I, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. And he said, that doesn't matter. And I said, well, Ronnie, call my brother. And he said, no, we want you. So uh, Ronnie was kind enough to put me on as um, head of the committee, which was kind of a joke because I he does all the work and I just kind of go to the meetings and enjoy um, visiting with all the scientists from all over the world. But I remember the first meeting I went to after daddy died, and that was in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And we... Um, I was very nervous and I was still crying about losing my dad. And I remember going up to all these young scientists and scientists, as I said, from all over the world. And it was real interesting. They'd come up and they'd say, they'd see Borlaug on my name tag and then they'd start crying and then I'd cry. And then they'd go, your father was just the most wonderful person in the world. And he always asked about our grandchildren and our, our, our children or our own education. And, um, it struck me that he was not only a scientist, but he was just a real humanitarian. He loved people, he loved scientists, and he just always wanted to um, engage, especially in the youth. And he tried to, and he, he did a great job of doing that. So um, I, I really have enjoyed my time with BGRI and I look forward to many more years, but I feel sad that we haven't been able to get together, but I've had, wonderful opportunities with that program. And it's great to see the scientists uh, moving ahead and doing the work that my dad would be so proud of. And as far as the WIT, um, I was honored to have that named after me. And again, I asked Ronnie, Ronnie asked me if they could put name it in my, my name. And I said, no, put it in my mom's name because she was really the hero. And he said, no, we'll put it in your name. But it's been a great opportunity for me to meet young science, young women scientists from throughout the world. And at this point, with we're down to this is our tenth year of awarding this to um, women that are young, early in their career, and we have uh, given this award to fifty five women throughout the world. And we have a real uh, link to they have a real link to each other, and we're working to hopefully someday have a reunion with all of them together, which I think would just be wonderful. And then we also have another program which uh, goes along with the WIT, which uh, gives an award to a mentor of one of these young women. 
and um, it can be a, a, a gentleman or a woman, a lady. And um, we've done this for the last nine years. And that's um, important because mentorship, as my dad would say, was so important for the future generations. Beautiful. Um, well, thank you so much for everything you do. Um, thanks for being with us here today. And we, I, I promise you, we look forward to hosting you on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota as soon as we can do so safely. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. So th thank you. Um, what an honor to have Jeannie with us today. Um, we also have a, a special um, surprise for, for everyone today. Uh, we're, we're joined by Arif Hussein today. Arif is the Chief Economist and Director of Research Assessment and Monitoring Division for the United uh, Nations World Food Program, uh, which is headquartered in Rome, Italy. Arif joined the World Food Program in 2003 and has served many senior positions, both in the field and the headquarters. He's also worked for the World Food Bank and taught at the Hubert H. Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs. Arif's work focuses on analyzing food security um, and welfare conditions in developing countries to inform humanitarian responses. And his research interests include application of information technologies to improve humanitarian response, understanding the linkages between poverty, hunger, conflict, and migration, and analyzing how global economic shocks impact food security, social protection, and emergency and development assistance. Arif has a PhD in agricultural and applied economics with a minor in forestry from the University of Minnesota. And we're especially fortunate to have Arif with us um, today, this day in particular, uh, because earlier today, the uh, World Food Program was awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts to mitigate hunger. Arif, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. I was at that campus uh, 23 years ago. I finished my PhD, but it just feels like it was yesterday. And I still miss being at the campus. We used to call it classroom, classroom office building. It's a, it's a very special uh, place to me and will always be. Yes, like, uh, like uh, Dr. Borlaug, it's a, it's a special day. That was 50 years ago for us. That special day is today. Uh, we got uh, we couldn't get to to Oslo because of COVID, but we had a ceremony, great ceremony online, basically just today, and uh, we received the the medal with uh, with Jenny showed, and it's the same I think still, and uh, and also the diploma. So so a, a great great day in that sense. Um, all I wanted to say was uh, one question, okay, why did WFP receive that medal? I mean, you know, and uh, essentially three things. Uh, one is we are front and center in combating hunger worldwide. So any given year we help uh, about 100 million people in 88 countries um, through food assistance. It could be just food as in food, but also with cash assistance. So that's, that's uh, one reason. The second reason essentially is because uh, we, are, we are trying to better conditions uh, for peace in conflict affected areas. Now, what is, what is amazing is that um, there is absolutely no doubt that we have enough food in this world to feed everybody um, and then some, uh, but the problem is the vast part of our world right now is dealing with conflicts. So about 60, 70% of the 690 million people who we call chronically food insecure, um, they live in conflict affected countries or the 270 million people who don't know where their next meal is gonna come from. That is the case because of conflict. 70, 80% of those people live in conflict affected countries. So if we want a hunger free world by 2030, as the SDG sustainable development goals suggest, we need to deal with the root causes. And one big root cause is essentially conflict. And what we are trying to do, and this is the third thing which was, was, uh, was recognized by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee was uh, essentially 
that food should not be used as a weapon of war. We should not be starving people as a, as a, as a policy or as a tactic in a war. And what we are trying to do is to, to kind of use food as a weapon of peace. We're you know, coming, helping them out earlier so they don't have to resort to things like joining extremist groups and things like that. Because what we're clearly seeing is that there is a, there is a very clear relationship between um, starvation, destabilization and migration. And this migration is not the good migration. This is the migration out of destitution. You know? so, so this is the reason the recognition of all of this together with our partners is the reason why we, we, we got the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, uh, talking to the university, talking to students, I have three messages uh, for them, uh, which I follow in my, my own life as well. Uh, I learned many of them at the university. And then the first one of that is get the wrong right, which means spend time getting your problem statement right. What are you trying to solve? Because if you don't get that right, if you don't get your problem statement right, you may be solving something, but it's just not the right problem. So it is really, really important to know what the problem is, what's wrong. Because if you know what's wrong, then maybe you can solve it. The second thing I want to say is that um, you 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 have to you have to start to believe that um, you cannot dismiss things as somebody else's problem. We live in a 21st century in a globalized world where I like to say that actions and reactions are no longer in the same place. What I mean is that. You may have war in Syria, but refugees show up in Europe. You may have economic uh, instability in Central America and economic migrants show up at the doorstep of the United States. And uh, you may have issues in the Sahel and people coming through the Sahara Desert through Libya into Europe. And we spend a lot more resources and a lot of more um, effort to keep then keep them out or then or try to help them in the countries when when they have arrived, but we don't do enough to make their lives better in places where they wanted to stay, and that means addressing the root causes again, solving the war so people don't have to make crazy decisions and 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 try to try to um, try to move and. Uh, and the last, the third thing for me is answer the so what question. In your research, when you 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 have analyzed the problem, don't just leave it at the analysis. Also, tell the policymakers, the decision makers, the politicians, why should it matter to them? What is so important? Why 690 million people starving every day should be should be be important to somebody sitting in a rich country. And if we can make those connections between our research and the importance of that for decision-making, I think we can make a much, much bigger impact. I think I'll stop here, thank you. Beautiful words. Um, thank you very much for making time to be with us today and for in inspiring um, students, uh, University of Minnesota and, and around the world. We really do appreciate the work that you have done and congratulations to you and your colleagues on this um, momentous day. Thank you very much. Really appreciate being here. So, so next it's my privilege to introduce Holly Ann Tufan. Uh, Holly is an associate director for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Crop Improvement. She's also co-director of the Gender Responsive Researchers Equipped for Agricultural Transformation project that's the GREAT project. And she's adjunct faculty member of plant breeding and genetics um, at Cornell University. She has a very multidisciplinary background that spans plant pathogen interactions, plant breeding, uh, program management for international agricultural research, uh, and gender research and capacity development across sub-Saharan Africa. 
Holly is the 2019 recipient of the Norman Borlaug Field Award and completed her PhD in molecular biology from the John Innes Center in the UK. And today, Holly will speak to us on Take It to All the Farmers, Women and Girls at the Center of Food Security. Holly, thanks for being here. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Let me share my screen here. Okay, is that, oh, everybody see the screen okay? Right, looks thank very you. Good. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank to all the organizers for inviting me to this really important event. And it's just so inspiring to heal all the achievements of Norman Borlaug and those of us who are the hunger fighters following in his footsteps. It just reinvigorates uh, the interest and the passion that we're all striving towards. Uh, I also just want to call out Jeannie. Thank you for the WIT. I'm one of the first WIT awardees, and it's just such an honor. The, the doors that that event opened, I was in St. Petersburg, so I think I just feel really a connection to this community. Um, I just want to take a few moments this morning today to think about specifically about women and girls and their role at the center of food security. So as I think about Norman Borlaug and his legacy and 50 years ago today winning, uh, winning the Nobel Prize, I think of some of his last words and how it really reflected how he lived and breathed his mission. And that was take it to the farmer. And as a young scientist and a researcher, as I think of those words and I reflect on them, what I think about is her and millions of others farmers like her. So it's important to think about women because the, the face of farming is really female. Women are farmers, they're entrepreneurs, but they also have caregiving roles as mothers and daughters, but they also have community roles. They keep communities together. So they're really the backbone of agricultural livelihoods. And often this may seem obvious, but in terms of policy and programming, this is not always following through, through in how much attention we give to women and their needs in agricultural programming. And that's resulted in what's really characterized as the gender gap. And so the central problem here is on the same equivalent pieces of land, women produce 20 to 30% less than men. They, have, they own only a fraction of land globally. These are really global issues. So land holding is a huge issue for women farmers, as well as education. They enjoy fewer years of formal education. They have less access to finances and credit and also technology inputs such as seeds and fertilizers and any other complementary inputs that were so essential to the green revolution, for example. And all of this really stems from what we call gender-based constraints. What this means is women are not able to access the same opportunities as men globally in agriculture because of their gender. So whereas smallholder farmers will have issues or constraints such as small land holdings, limited range of finance and credit options, access to markets and information or productivity. Women in particular will have particular issues accessing land because of customary laws or formal laws that restrict their ownership or bank policies up until the 80s or 90s even in Australia that required a married woman's signature to obtain her husband's signature, uh, attain her husband's signature to get any credit or social norms that limit women's networking abilities or mobility to really engage fully in all the benefits from ag-based livelihoods. And even within a household that how the inequalities in household income and how those are distributed within a household. So as researchers, as we know these issues and care about them and think about them, what is our role? Why should we be thinking about the gender gap or gender-based constraints or gender issues in our research? Simply, I think, for two reasons. One, it's just good science. And this has become more and more apparent in fields outside of agriculture. This is an editorial from Nature just this week, talking about the European Union and the pivot that has happened in granting there, where accounting for sex and gender differences in fields such as health, design, or, or engineering, and researchers realizing that they have realized the harms of not accounting for sex differences in research. So this has been a, a very big movement in a lot of fields to start understanding the differential effects or inputs that we need to think about. And for work out of Stanford from Londa Schiebinger, she has this website called Gendered Innovations looking at really interesting and concrete case studies where designing for men as the norm has 
actual documented negative implications on women. For example, seat belts have been designed with the male body as the norm. And in crashes, pregnant women are disproportionately harmed because of those design issues, not taking into account their bodies and their needs. So it's just good science, thinking about differences and thinking about what women and girls need and want. But I think it's also about social justice. So there's a history of inequality and that women and girls really face systematic barriers to engaging in ag-based livelihoods. It's a question of social justice to rectify that. So the sustainable development goals have a specific goal on gender equality and countless research studies show that really focusing on women and girls in the heart of development, but not excluding men and boys. So inclusive development has the most potential to impact all the areas that we're seeking to impact through development. And food security is definitely one of those. So Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution and the outputs of that movement really pivoted on plant breeding and improved varieties. So as I talk about these gender issues and good science and social justice, how does that really play into plant breeding? What I personally believe is we may have lost sight a little bit that plant breeding should be more about people than plants, that we're really endeavoring to, to benefit the lives of people. Yet, if you look at most public sector crop breeding programs globally, breeding objectives and goals are still defined through expert input and the community feedback from communities targeted with those varieties are very weak. We also tend to breed for geography rather than demography. What that means is we look at the environment that the plant is grown in more than we look at the people whose fields those plants are growing in. So thinking more in nuanced ways about defining target environments, not just to be the, the agroecological, but also the socioeconomic. How can we bring the demographic? How can we know more about the people interacting, growing, processing, and selling those varieties? and how they're being impacted by the choices we make as breeders. And we show again, countless studies showing that gender divisions of labor and women's roles and men's roles and how they interact with these varieties really define both their preferences and their choices. So really striving to think about how can we not think about genetic gains alone, but also think about equity gains specifically for women and girls. And this really requires to re-examine our priorities in plant breeding. So we talk a lot about integrating gender into breeding goals, but maybe we should be thinking about how can we integrate breeding into gender equality goals? So how can we operationalize the outcomes of breeding to positively impact gender equality goals? So being very intentional and systematic about doing that so that we're not only effective in what we produce as plant breeders, but we're also contributing to social justice. And the reason why I'm saying this is possible is we've shown through the case studies and continuing work, I'll highlight three examples here. The first is from maize in China, where the simple inclusion of women in participatory field trials expanded their choices of action, their social networks, and the benefits they had from research. So that simple act of inclusion alone could have a positive outcome on those women's lives. The second is around sorghum and Mali in West Africa in a project where they, where they particularly targeted women to evaluate varieties for their quality characteristics, that that inclusion of women's voices and choices not only brought them into the fold, but then allowed them to diversify their economic activities as they got into more seed production related work. And the third of is barley in Syria looking at just including women again in research processes had them recognized as farmers, whereas before they were not recognized formally as farmers even, but helpers of farmers who were their husbands. So these seems trivial, but in the grand scheme of things have huge implications for social norms and positive livelihood impacts for women and girls through the actions and outcomes of breeding. And I wanna highlight for 30 seconds what this means for a practical breeding program how can we do this in our own work? And this is a project called NextGen Cassava that's funded by the Gates Foundation and the UK government, working in three countries in Sub-Saharan Africa on cassava improvement. And what we've done here is if you look at this top right quadrant is first of all, we did not just engage farmers, 
but we were very intentional about engaging a very diverse set of farmers, geographically, wealth status, sex, migration status, so that we worked with a diversity of farmers to get information on what characteristics they wanted out of cassava. So it was a very intentional selection. And the second part of it, we were looking at how relatively important those different traits for, were for different individuals. So not only looking at their sex and age, but their poverty level, their food security level, and their engagement in different value chain roles. And also intra-household, looking at how husbands and wives had different needs or preferences. So we're bringing that social complexity and that nuance into the work to not just breed for a one typical farmer that ha may have been male, but really looking at the diversity of farmers that are engaging with cassava production. So as I close this session and at the close of 2020, as we look back in this, in this tumultuous year and think and reflect, I would just hope that especially those of you at the beginning of your careers and thinking about your impact and thinking about where you're thinking of going, Maybe think about taking it to all farmers and just thinking in refined ways of who we're impacting and how can we positively impact women and girls, especially in all of our work. So I'll stop there and thank the organizers very much again for the opportunity and have my email here if you would like to contact me for any question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly, um, really important work and thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Um, now I'll introduce Shengen Fen. Uh, Shengen is Chair Professor and Dean of the Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy at China Agricultural University. Shengen is a CPANS alumnus. Uh, he received a PhD in Applied Economics from the University of Minnesota and holds bachelor's and master's degree from Nanjing Agricultural University in China. From 2009 to 2019, prior to joining uh, China Agricultural University, Sheng Sheng Fen was Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Sheng first joined IFPRI as a research fellow in 1995, conducting extensive research on pro-poor development strategies, hunger and malnutrition, and sustainable food systems globally, as well as in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. He led IFPRI's program on public investment before becoming the director of the Institute's Development Strategy and Governance Division in 2005. And he served as a member of vice chair and chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Food and Nutrition Security. In 2014, Schengen received the Hunger Hero Award from the World, the World Food Program in recognition of his commitment to and leadership of um, uh, hunger fighting efforts worldwide. Schengen was awarded an honorary life membership of the International Association of Agricultural Economists in 2018 and became a fellow of the American Applied Economics Association in 2020. We're very excited to hear from Schengen today uh, and he will speak on global food system transformation, the roles of policy technologies and institutions. Schengen, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, I studied in Minnesota from 1985 to 1989 uh, under the Werner Rutan, who happened to be a student of, of uh, Maman Balak. My personal interaction with uh, Dr. Balak was around 2003. I remember we had a workshop at the University of Minnesota, uh, sorry, at, uh, at the uh, IPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, and we were discussing what Africa really needs to end hunger and malnutrition. So in the middle of the discussion, Dr. Norman Balak said, well, we need infrastructure, infrastructure, and infrastructure. That really inspired my own work. So I have done a lot of work to look at the, the impact of investment, particularly in rural roads on poverty reduction or hunger reduction in India, in Vietnam, in Thailand, and of course in China and in many other African countries. So uh, I think a really great honor to be affiliated with Dr. Norman Balak through the University of Minnesota. So my greetings to, to Jenny, the family of Dr. Balak. So to celebrate Dr. Balak's, it's a 50 years anniversary of receiving the World Food Peace Prize. So I'm, I wanted to look at the, 
the future food and nutrition security for the next 50 years. The so food system must be transformed in the next 50 years. And I wanted to emphasize the importance of technologies, policies, and institutions. So yes, our current food system are already under master threats. And the COVID obviously made everything worse, including our food system. Our food system is very vulnerable. And the technologies, policies, and institutions are key to food system transformation. Now, um, Dr. Hossein has already mentioned that we are facing tremendous challenges. Yes, we have 900, sorry, 690 million people suffer from hunger, lack of food. And here I wanted to emphasize that there are other dimensions of malnutrition. Two billion people suffer from lack of micronutrients we call it hidden hunger. And two billion people suffer from overweight and obesity. We just cannot let all these different forms of malnutrition continue. So business as usual, if we don't do anything by 2030, we will have more than 800 million people suffer from hunger. So instead of zero, and we actually have more hungry people. So SDG has no way to be achieved. And there is a very high correlation between child stunting and the affordability of the healthy diets. So you will see from the right-hand side, you will see high correlation. So when the people cannot afford the healthy diets, particularly children, and the children are very likely to be stunted. And when a child is stunted, it's a life sentence. So that child's growth, health, and uh, earning potential, and their IQ will be compromised. Now, the, on the environmental side, we are also facing tremendous pressure. You know, our planetary has boundaries. If you look at the right-hand side, you will see that in our genetic diversity, the use of phosphate and fertilizers are already beyond the red zone. So, you know, this plants, plants, our earth has boundaries. And then all these are very related to food and agriculture. And the climate change is in yellow zone. And if we don't do anything very quickly, we will also go to the red zone. The red zone mean, really means that it's very difficult for us to go back. It's like a tipping point. We don't want to go to the red zone. But look at the climate change, the next hand side. So right now, uh, the food system and agriculture emit about probably 20, um, let's say, trigons of, of carbon emission. We wanted to reduce that to five trillion tons because you know, if, not, if, if we don't do anything, 20 trigger down itself will already make our planet two degree warmer. So we must transform our food system to reduce carbon emission you know, drastically and significantly. So now in terms of policy, let me talk about technology first because Naman Bala uh, really introduced the high yielding wheat varieties. So the technologies, I think the future technologies must have multiple wins. Uh, win in yield, win in nutrition, and win in climate resilience. I think uh, uh, Hella mentioned about a win in gender. Yeah, I very much agree. The, the women must benefit from the uh, high yielding varieties or new modern technologies. So we have seen success, some success already. For example, biofortification. You know, we can add micronutrients to food crops, vitamin A, zinc, and iron. And then right now, more than 50 million smallholders and their, their families are already consuming biofortified foods. So when the children consume biofortified foods, so their, the content of the micronutrients in their food intake will be enhanced and their, their health will be improved as a result. And obviously low carbon, you know, there are technologies similar, you know, I think where Dr. Norman Bollock has worked, has introduced many varieties that has certain, let's say, advantages in uh, building let's say, resilience against heat waves, against um, let's say, rust and, and, and beyond. So the multiple wins include a win in yield, win in nutrition and health, win let's say, in carbon let's say, neutrality, in saving water and uh, protect our environment. Now, obviously, 
multiple wind technology goes beyond traditional agriculture technologies, for example, ICT technologies. You know, IC, the use of ICT can be really a game changer in transforming our food system. So for example, the use of mobile phones, internet tracking, and uh, e-commerce uh, and beyond. And here in China, you know, we are in the middle of the internet revolution in food and agriculture. So the internet can really link millions and millions of producers with millions, millions, millions consumers without much intermediaries in between. So that really cut down the transaction, transaction costs significantly. Noble foods, uh, I think Ronnie Kaufman mentioned about some of the alternative proteins, single cell proteins. Again, this could be a really game changer. Some of the studies from IPRI have shown that the alternative proteins can really cut down the carbon emission by more than 90%, cut down the water use, cut down the land use by 90%. By 90%. Well, obviously the good question is, what do we do with the smallholders? But we needed to open our mind to see how this technology will involve and how can we develop certain policies to embrace these technologies while protecting smallholders and a vulnerable population. Now, reforming policies. Policy is another key element in transforming our food system for both human and planetary health. So right now, the whole world is spending about $700 billion agriculture subsidy. These subsidies are used to, let's say, to subsidize fertilizers, water, pesticides, and out price, out price support for major staple foods, wheat, rice, and wheat. And these subsidies now uh, are not sustainable. They do not provide healthy and nutritious foods for many, and definitely they are not economic, economically efficient. So how can we repurpose the subsidies to use this money, let's say, to support the IND and the value chain development of more nutritious, healthy foods like fruits, vegetables, beans, and so on, obviously by fortification. And then we could also increase the investment in rural roads. That was adopted Dr. Norman Barlock's statement at April in 2003. So if we invest more in rural roads, then smallholders will be able to sell their the fresh produce to urban markets, and it will be able to also uh, reduce their trans transactions costs in buying inputs from, from the market. Now, okay, if there are unhealthy, unsustainable foods, can we tax them? You know, tax carbon intensive and in nutrition, nutrient poor foods. Again, don't just uh, give this money to, to a public funds or to the government revenue. Instead, we keep that money in the agriculture. We use that money to invest more you know, in R&D, in the development of value chains of more nutritious and healthy foods. For example, uh, the sugar, sugar tax in Mexico, in Chile, in UK have already worked. Have already worked. Uh, the, the sugar consumption has declined uh, in these countries where the sugar taxes have been imposed. And enhanced nutrition targeted social protection. You know, it is still the case that there are millions and millions of people who do not have income, do not have means to access to healthy and nutritious foods. And can we use a social protection and link that with a nutrition improvement? So we have seen that in Mexico and we have seen that uh, in many Latin American countries. I really wanted to see more here in Asia, in Southeast Asia, including China. Now, the private sector, you know, we know that majority of foods are produced by private sector, including smallholders. You know, smallholders, they're running business. You know, they are private sector. But let's make sure that the, we do provide incentives. We do provide an enabling environment for the private sector to deliver both let's say, nutrition and environmental outcome. Now, the, the food industry plays a particular role here. So can we restrict marketing of foods that are ultra-processed and high in fats, sugars, salt, and children? So can we do that? And incentive, incentivize retailers to make better quality diets available and reduce and the appeal of lower quality diets. And I encourage the industry to 
let's really invest in R and D, you know, to promote more healthy and nutritious products. I think the private sectors has incentives to do that, but what they need is good policy, good enabling environment, and it's it's a job of economists, it's a job of policy analysts to provide that for the government to make positive transaction. And institutions are very critical. I think Helen mentioned about about the uh, the women's empowerment. You know, make sure that technologies do benefit women. But I wanted to go beyond that. The women must have access to inputs, access to political power, access is to community leadership, and to make sure that the, the time use is very much appreciated, valued. You know, doing some of the green revolution era here in China, it is women who work harder than men. You know, to harvest some of the high yielding varieties. I think in the future we make sure that women don't spend that much time uh, in promoting all these high yielding varieties and a strength of natural, you know, the, the property rights of natural resources, including water, land, and beyond. Now, the obviously the, the civil servants, you know, must have the incentives to perform better. So can we use the modern technologies to measure the success, measure their, uh, their performance? Uh, I think we can do that. We have seen that in Rwanda. We have seen that in Ethiopia. We have seen that in India. We have also seen that here in China. So my final observation is technologies are critical, is a must. Just like what Dr. Norman Malik had done during his uh, career time with Summit and beyond. And the policies are equally important. And institutions are also very critical. So we must all work together to push this through three critical instruments to make sure that we can deliver both, both let's say, um, planetary and human health outcomes and make sure that everybody has access to healthy and nutritious foods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shingen. That um, was very insightful. We really appreciate your comments. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I know it's very late where you are today, um, and we're, we're, we're delighted to, that you could join us. And next, um, I'm happy to introduce Barbara Stimson, who is the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. Barbara assumed leadership of the World Food Prize Foundation of Janu uh, January of this year and uh, build, building on more than 30 years of experience championing environmental public policy, research, and project innovations through collaborative solutions. Um, Barbara is only the second president of the foundation since it was established in 1986 by Norman Orlog. Barbara, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Jim, and thanks to everyone, not only joining us, but uh, all of the panelists all of the work that you are doing is uh, by rights the purpose of our organization. So the World Food Prize Foundation, uh, and uh, I'm newest uh, to the organization probably of almost anyone uh, that's uh, leading this call. Um, the mission of our organization is elevating innovations and inspiring action to sustainably increase the quality, quantity, and availability of food for all. Uh, so that means our job really is to recognize, uh, inspire, and elevate uh, all of those that are working so hard, like uh, those that you're seeing today and so many on this call. We are working to preserve and protect not only food production in a sustainable fashion, but the pr precious natural resources to provide nourishing food, to overall improve the environment of global food security and all that's being done in that work. So uh, I have the honor of leading the World Food Prize as we continue this mission and try to honor those who have successfully worked towards this goal, uh, calling, to, calling attention to not only the improvements that have been done, but we also really feel our responsibility to identify what more needs to be done. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, more about Norman Forlog and about uh, what we see in the future moving forward. So as has been said, uh, Dr. Borlaug was the father of the Green Revolution and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. He started the World Food Prize Foundation in 1986. 
And I think one of the reasons he did it is because in that 16 years, he saw the power and impact of uh, receiving this award uh, and the influence that then he was able to have not only in his day-to-day -day work, but in the policy arena and with so many different kinds of stakeholders. So he uh, identified, I think, the power of that elevation uh, of action and inspiring others to end food, to uh, end hunger and starvation, and uh, to continue to inspire all of us. So he created the prize, uh, it, it really in order to recognize role models that already exist to inspire others, but he was passionate about young people. So uh, one of the great joys of the World Food Prize Foundation and my discovery since I've been here is uh, recognizing how firsthand Dr. Borlaug saw the meaningful impact that can be had providing opportunities for young people to excel in food and agricultural science. So 30-something uh, years later, we have awarded 50 World Food Prize laureates. Uh, with recognition for their elevation. Um, 12 Borlaug Field Award winners, uh, including Holly Antifan. Uh, and really all of our laureates and everything that you're hearing today, uh, our award winners around the world, recognize something I think we all see. The single greatest challenge we really face in the 21st century is trying to sustainably be 10 billion people by 2050. Uh, this Proposition means that if we're successful, we will produce more food in the next 30 years than has been produced in the last 10,000 years combined. But we have to do it differently. We have to do it with fewer resources, less water, less land, fewer inputs, and we have to do it in the context of climate change and the variety of erratic weather conditions that we see. So the question is not, can we feed 10 billion people? It's how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna do it in a way that's sustainable, safe, affordable, nutritious for everyone year round? This is a vision that I think we all hold. And uh, I'll have to say that this year uh, in the International Borlaug Dialogue, which is hosted every year, usually in Des Moines, but virtually this year, so you can have access to all of the resources and uh, incredible discussion that went on. Um, the global commitment to meet this challenge was uh, really solidified. I mean, I, I, of course, we he have been hearing this for years and we've heard it in this year, especially under the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think the recognition that the policy environment, the science, the research practices, the mobilization of food uh, to meet a challenge that really does it all, sustainably producing enough food for all has to happen. We see industry leadership shifting and the private sector really taking on this mission, uh, both large and small companies, partnerships and collaboration growing everywhere to create the synergies that are really needed to jointly address and agree on the, the trade-offs and how to address those. We see it at the international level, at the national level, and, and down to the kinds of projects that you've been hearing about today. So the World Food Prize is passionate uh, about all of this. Um, and I, I will say that uh, one of the strongest and growing components of the organization that may not be as well known is how passionate we are and how much we're mobilizing the youth uh, and young professionals in all of our work. So roughly 10,000 students from around the country and around the world participate in some kind of a, a, a World Food Prize Youth Institute. Uh, or preparation for one, then 1,200 participate in an actual youth institute. The Global Youth Institute elevates some 200. Um, you'll see some of them today, actually, uh, later after, after my speech. Um, the youth institutes are devoted to supporting young, young people and the next generation of hunger fighters. So we've been working with land grant universities around the world for years. Some 25 institutes are, are hosted each year. And our partnership with the University of Minnesota is crucial among those. Dr. Norman Borlaug's alma mater, et cetera, um, being a hallmark of it. 
So let me just say that uh, 2021 is going to be the year of the UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, youth are being asked to engage, youth and young professionals to engage in the definition of uh, all of the elements of the summit's platform and the dialogues that will take place throughout the year. Um, this is critical participation. Our own youth institutes are writing a white paper to contribute to the climate discussions uh, within uh, the UN Food Systems Summit. And really, uh, the youth programming and the uh, the growth of the next generation of hunger fighters is probably some of the most important work all of us do. So it's my absolute pleasure to be continuing the partnership with the University of Minnesota and uh, recognizing an incredible 50 years of, of Dr. Norman Borlaug. And we're just proud of the World Food Prize Foundation to be trying to continue to extend his legacy and his vision. Thank you so much. Barbara, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you highlighting some of the important work that takes place through the, the World Food Prize Foundation. Um, University of Minnesota is very proud to host the Minnesota Youth Program, the Minnesota Youth Institute that is part of the uh, uh, Global uh, Inst uh, Youth Institute that, that uh, Barbara spoke about in just a moment, just a moment ago. Um, and we're delighted to have with us three alums of the Minnesota Youth Institute Program. Um, first, I'm happy to introduce Aiden uh, Stadilli, a first year student in CFANS studying plant science and food systems, and a 2020 Borlaug scholar who participated in the Minnesota Youth Institute. Aiden hopes to improve agricultural practices in other countries uh, to work towards food security for all. And in the meantime, is excited to participate in events like we're hosting today, Nobel and beyond, uh, as well as the Borlaug Institute. So Aiden, thank you so much for being here. Awesome, thank you. Um, so hello everybody, it's really great to be here and especially to be able to listen to all the speakers that we've had today. Um, it's events like these that are a big inspiration to me, so it's really it's really great to be here. Um, before this, I was involved in the Minnesota Youth Institute, and then after that, the Global Youth Institute, um, where I spent months researching the water crisis in the country of my choosing, so I chose Cambodia, and how wastewater had a profound impact on the food people ate and how lack of sanitary infrastructure in rural regions was the source of serious issues economically, in terms of health, and in the poverty of the country. So after my research, I typed it all up and I brought my paper to my first conference um, among people my age who were delving into food systems for what, probably, for what was probably their first time as well. So when it was all said and done, I felt I had finally got a taste of how big agricultural agriculture plays in the future of all of us. So it reaches into every aspect of our life as proven in the wide diversity of topics and countries that were the focus of the dozens of papers that I got to read. Um, and then soon after, um, and with the help of my amazing group leaders, um, Mary Buschetti and Priscilla Trin, who are both here today, um, I found out I was selected to attend the Global Youth Institute, um, which is a virtual conference um, for this year at least, featuring speakers and students, professors and CEOs, people from all positions in agriculture that were coming together for two weeks um, to get together and try to find a solution for hunger. So for me, these are the stepping stones towards something bigger, and I'm very excited to one day make some very real change. Um, so thank you to everyone who made this possible, and please enjoy the rest of this event. Aiden, thank you. Thanks for your passion, and congratulations on being selected for the Global Youth Institute as well. Um, next, we're very happy to have with us Priscilla Trin. Uh, Priscilla is a third year CFAN student studying sustainable systems management. She is a 2018 Borlaug Scholar, a 2019 Borlaug Rune International Scholar uh, stationed at Erie, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And currently along with Mary Buschetti is co-coordinator of the Minnesota Youth Institute. Good morning, Priscilla. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Hello, everyone. My name is Priscilla. And like Aiden, um, what started out to be a school assignment turned out to be so much more involving with the Minnesota Youth Institute. It actually became a cultural deep dive into my heritage. So in 2016, Vietnam's coastlines were devastated by a chemical spill from a Taiwanese company. This had a direct impact on my uncle's fish market, and it spurred me to look into aquaculture in Vietnam, which became my research topic for the paper. So fast forward to enrolling at CFANS, conducting hydroponics research for two years, attending the Global Youth Institute, traveling across the world with the World Food Prize Foundation support, and then coming back to help with two more youth institutes. I think I've learned a few things to put it mildly. 
But what has struck me the most in my involvement is that um, it's been an opportunity to prove to my parents that young females are capable, the world is dangerous, but not unapproachable, and that agriculture with a capital A is a respectable field, not only suited for the uneducated poor. The MNYI has really allowed me to unravel deep rooted layers of negative cultural perceptions and show many that food happens on and off the field. What gives me hope for the future is that culturally we are becoming so much more aware of the importance of food systems and that it is complex. There are unintended consequences of the Green Revolution, but I have seen youth take that information, internalize it, and then run with it with renewed passion. The interconnectedness of us all, whether we like it or not, means that we don't have to sacrifice the zeal for feeding billions of people because of ideological differences. I'm excited to see how the dawning awareness of food sovereignty, food justice, and food security can coalesce in future hunger fighters. And I have the MNYI and World Food Prize to thank for that. That concludes my two cents. I'll pass it back to Jim. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. And agriculture with a capital A, I, I, I like that. And thank you for your involvement with the Minnesota Youth Institute. And uh, next we'll hear from Glenn Morris. Glenn graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in health sciences and a minor in environmental science policy and management. Glenn is currently a graduate assistant at Purdue University pursuing his master's and PhD in agriculture uh, health and safety in the field of rural biosecurity and agricultural disease prevention. Glenn, thanks for being here. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Braden, for that introduction. And also thank you to the University of Minnesota for hosting this uh, commemoration. I'm very fortunate to be one of the many alum who have been inspired by not only the work of Dr. Borlaug, but also the collective network that programs like the World Food Prize and the U of M have brought to many students. Um, across Minnesota and throughout the globe. 50 years ago when Dr. Borlaug was receiving his Nobel Peace Prize, I was not studying agriculture. Um, my journey with agriculture really started eight years ago uh, in high school. I am from a small rural town in southeast Minnesota and I learned about the World Food Prize and the Minnesota Youth Institute from my agricultural educators. I sat down and I researched Palau, a country in, uh, near the Philippines and near Micronesia. And I was looking at how communal farming practices were influenced in uh, tropical environments and, and smallholder farmers. I didn't think that my paper then would have such an influence on my life, but I'm, I'm so fortunate that it, it has. I then brought my paper and my research up to the University of Minnesota uh, where I was where the uh, Minnesota Youth Institute was held, that was in 2012. And coming from you know high school, Glenn, into the you know the, the big U of M, I we were able to tour you know USDA laboratories on campus. Um, soil scientists were presenting about microbiology and micronutrients. I remember a CFANS professor coming in with a pineapple and saying, you know, where does this pineapple come from? Where does your food come from? And I was very fortunate that next year to attend the Global Youth Institute, again, kind of echoing what a lot of the alum have said of the different um, just individuals and students that you meet there, uh, directors of agriculture, ministers of agriculture, people in the Foreign Agricultural Service have, who are um, well-respected and, and so innovative in advancing the work of food security, all, again, you know, coupled in with, with two, 300 youth from all over the world. I was very fortunate then to um, receive a, a Borla Gruan International Internship in Changsha, China that following year after my senior year. I was studying hybrid rice research and also looking at uh, communal or community impacts of, of hybrid rice. I was also very fortunate to have participated in the Wallace Carver Fellowships with the World Food Prize and Throughout my experience with um, in in high school and college, I was also working with the USDA and then also um, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in, in health uh, science research. And I wanted to, to couple these experiences together. And it was through the 
World Food Prize where I met faculty here at Purdue University. And I'm so very humbled and privileged to uh, be a Ross scholar in the Department of Agricultural Biology and Engineering, studying agricultural health and safety with a focus on uh, uh, biosecurity and disease prevention and how that influences training um, protocols and other agricultural practices. I have a, a really great uh, resource group and, and mentorship that's leading me on this journey. And looking back eight years ago in high school, I'm fortunate to, to see where I've become and excited about the next eight years. And I just to echo what a, a lot of alum can say, we're very appreciative of the opportunities that have been instilled with the legacy of Norman Borlaug. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And um, Glenn, um, Priscilla, Aiden, thank you so much for being with us today. And to all the Minnesota Youth Institute alumni that are attending this um, session, thank you for continuing to build on that Borlaug legacy. Um, I, 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 for one, feel that the future is in very good hands. And um, finally, today, it's, it's my privilege to introduce Brian Boer, who is Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, or CFANS, and Director of the Minnesota Agricultural uh, Experiment Station. Brian's been in this role for the past seven years and remains as a professor in applied economics. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Jim, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a great pleasure for us to honor and recognize uh, the work of of Dr. Borlaug and contributions to the University of Minnesota. I especially want to welcome uh, Jeannie Borlaug and thank her for joining us today. Jeannie, I, um, as you know, I'm a proud Northeast Iowa person. And so I regularly this summer and fall drive by um, the Borlaug home farm. And I guess you'd be happy to know that we had great crops this year. Uh, so it's um, always always enjoyable to, um, to know that we're connected with the family still in some ways. Um, I do, um, you want to recognize, you know, CFAN is of course delighted to host this because um, you know, Dr. Borlaug represents the highest ideals we have as a college and university to improve the world's um, ability to both feed itself as well as create social justice and food justice across the globe um, for all people and particularly important today. Um, one of the things that I think that um, I, I look back to to reflect on that was Dr. Borlaug's um, December 31st or sorry, December 11th, a uh, Nobel lecture. Um, and he talked about his dreams of feeding the world and what that would look like in years forward. And it was really quite an interesting read because in one level, it certainly represents the visionary leadership, the visionary ideals that Dr. Borlaug embodied um, and laid out really a template that I think is probably as, as relevant today as it was in 1970. And as he recognized, we have not solved these challenges that we have important work to do it's great to see these, these young people who are just speaking and their passion and dedication to this uh, makes us think and recognize we're all in good hands for the future because I think this will be an ongoing mission. But in CFANS, you know, what, one of the things that came up in just a few areas, of course, Dr. Borlaug and his development of you know, dwarf varieties of wheat uh, revolutionized that. And as he was giving that speech, he talked about triticum as developing new crops. And in CFANS, uh, we continue that work. And I think an interesting dimension of that is the aspect that we're developing crops such as camelina pennycrest, um, intermediate wheatgrass, and so on, that have not only those food values that we look for, um, of course, as the primary goal of ending hunger uh, and fighting hunger, but also preserves and protects our natural resources. Um, Dr. Borlaug recognized frequently that population and the growth and the demands on our natural resources were unlikely um, to be tamed as well. So how do we develop those crops and sustain those in that environment is a key part of work we continue to do. And I think um, he'd be delighted to see that work going forward. Um, we also, one of the other elements he described, of course, in grains, we all know that there are limiting amino, amino acids and the protein deficiencies that are across the globe are only growing. And we certainly know that uh, animal proteins are not going to su supplement those and because of cost and other factors. So the University of Minnesota recently developed the first in the nation plant protein innovation center that goes towards both crop development as well as taking those proteins into food products that serve the nutritional components missing in some of our grains. And we're hoping again to provide that nutrition that he talked about in 1970. And finally, one of the things I think that's interesting that uh, among the many things we're doing, um, I doubt that I didn't see any mention of the data revolution and data analytics and computational sciences and our ability to bring 
particularly in areas that have uh, soil challenges or climate challenges, to bring the right crops into the right locations with the right types of applications and help bring smallholder farmers in early enough real advancements. So example, for example, we work in Malawi, working on transitioning farmers there um, from tobacco production into food crop production and being able to do that in a way that they have the best possible returns to their, to their, their labor investment, their, their resources. So we're excited to do that. And of course, um, with plant pathology hosting this today, I really wanna thank um, Dr. Bradeen, um, Dr. Stephenson, everybody in plant pathology that continues through the Stakeman Borlaug Center, for example, be a leading international effort to address and vanquish some of the disease challenges we have in our crop systems that aren't likely to end soon either, but certainly that ongoing dedication to doing that that Dr. Borlaug expressed. And that's just a high level of some of that work that I'll emphasize again, the vision that Dr. Borlaug had in 1970, 50 years later, we're still marching along that line to try to achieve his goals and how prescient he was in identifying what these really challenging issues were and what we needed to work on, literally laying out a roadmap for us. I'll switch a little bit just briefly to, um, you know, Dr. Borlaug was passionate about education and the next generation of hunger fighters that we were just talking about today. And earlier, before I could join here, I apologize for being late, I was working on the board of our Minnesota Agricultural Education Leadership Council that's dedicated to advancing education in agriculture to K-12 students and beyond. And again, in, in his 1970 lecture, Dr. Borlaug said, um, and, and it's kind of a, a quest to continue that, he asked, where are the leaders who will, who will have the necessary scientific competence, the vision, the common sense, the social consciousness, the qualities of leadership and the persistent determination to convert the potential benefactions into real benefactions for mankind in general and for the hungry in particular. He said, there are not enough of them now. Therefore, we must try to identify and develop them in our educational systems, and we must utilize them in our campaigns for food production. So again, with the young people we just had a chance to hear from, we're carrying on that mission. In a few places, you know, we don't all get to rest on our laurels and watch this happen. So the call to do some of that work, and there's some ideas um, that we have for how you can all be involved in this. One of those is to get involved in the US UN Food System Summit in 2021. A second uh, critical area that's uh, here at the Minnesota, University of Minnesota is the Norman E. Borlaug Fellowship in International Agriculture. That was actually started um, with a vision and idea of Dr. Stephenson and his wife, Winnie, um, to create uh, PhD fellowship, graduate fellowships for young scientists and encourage them to become higher fighters and literally following those footsteps. If you think about the statue that's on the St. Paul campus of Dr. Borlaug, as well as in the Capitol Rotunda in the US Capitol, to literally follow in those footsteps and continue on that fight. So that's an opportunity to engage with that and contribute to that effort, either drawing people in, advocating for investments there and assuring that goes forward. Certainly it's been talked about many times, uh, Ms. Stinson was talking about the Minnesota Youth Institute. We're delighted to have a sex successful institute here at the University of Minnesota with the support of the World Food Prize and the efforts they contribute in the Global Youth Institute to help school student, high school students um, gain knowledge about agriculture, find a vision, find their passion um, that Dr. Borlaug had to, to fight hunger. And right now we're in the process of, of uh, forging new relationships with the Minneapolis public school systems and bringing agriculture fight, hunger fighters from, these, from urban areas who might not have experience in agriculture to think about how they can contribute. So we're excited to continue that legacy. And we look for your support as an expert, as mentoring students to be a part of the Minnesota Youth Institute. Uh, I encourage you to advocate for students and support and recommend students to attend uh, land grants like the University of Minnesota and others um, to carry on that mission as well. So if you find a student who's looking for a career pathway and an opportunity to impact the world, of course, our great land grant universities, uh, uh, which Dr. Borlaug would also champion are a key way to advance that. And finally, um, we're looking to identify in, in CFANS 50 hunger fighters to recognize uh, that are dedicated to moving forward Dr. Borlaug's le legacy. So if you have someone you think of as a true hunger fighter, somebody who's committed passionately to, to serving that goal, please nominate uh, someone. You can send that to Mary Buschetti or myself or Dr. Berdeen, and we'll get them on, a, on the list so we can identify those hunger fighters. So with that, uh, thank you for all your work you do. I know the group that is on this is dedicated to this uh, very critical mission. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today.
Thank you, Brian. Uh, we appreciate the, the, the words. Uh, my colleagues have put um, a series of links in the chat for many of the uh, ways to get involved that, that Brian highlighted. Um, I, I also want to remind everybody that hunger is not only a global issue, it's also local, uh, particularly in the midst of this pandemic. Um, please consider supporting local food banks as well. And um, at this point, I would like to thank all of our distinguished speakers for sharing their time with us today and for offering insights on the fight against hunger and how Norman Borlaug has inspired the past 50 years of work in this area, as well as the 50 years that are yet to come.